everybody. We're really excited to have everybody here for our sixth um, Give seminar or sixth seminar for this uh, this semester. Um, a bit of a reminder to everybody that next week and the following week we have a two week teaching break. So our next um, Give seminar will be actually in a couple of weeks time. Um, I'm going to hand over to Michaela to do housekeeping and then I'll introduce our speaker for today. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining the Cecil Give Psychology Seminar Series. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules, uh, just a reminder that this seminar is being recorded and will be available on the Psychology Events page and YouTube. Uh, you'll also be sent um, the recording via email. Um, just a quick note there, we have been having some issues with our YouTube channel, um, so as soon as that's available, um, we'll send it out. Um, upon entry of the webinar, you've all been muted and we please ask that you stay muted for the duration of the seminar. Um, if you have any questions, you can write them in the question box below at any time and we'll have question time at the end. Thank you and I'll hand off uh, back to Kristen. So we are really excited about our presenter today. So Dr. Connell Monaghan is a new member of staff here in RSP in some very late 2019 and into 2020. Um, so this is our first clinical health theme speaker for this semester. Um, and we're really thrilled that Connell was willing to share his exciting research with us today. Um, so Connell is a lecturer here in RSP and he's primarily teaching in the Master of Professional Psychology program. Um, so I'm very lucky to call him a close colleague, um, compatriots in our day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, he has a range of interests in research, so he has a really strong interest in personality and personality disorders, uh, particular Machiavellianism as a construct, um, but also in statistics, psychometrics um, and clinician burnout. Um, in addition to that, he informs me that he is a saltwater fish tank and cycling enthusiast, um, and we're really happy um, to hear from him and his research today about how to make research more shiny. So I'm going to hand over to Connell, um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kristen. Give me one second to share my slides. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to get the opportunity to talk to everyone uh, today about some research that we've been doing uh, on making research more shiny in, in terms of increasing the quality of participant engagement. Um, this is part of our, our new lab here at the ANU, the Personality Individual Differences and Assessment Lab, but we're still working on a title. So if you have any new suggestions, we'd absolutely love to hear them. Although today's presentation is part of the um, health and wellbeing stream, um, we're gonna try just talking about something slightly different today. In the, in the words of the Reverend John Cleese, something completely different. But hopefully the concepts we discussed today will spark some new ideas, some different areas around the RSP and open your minds to some new possibilities that are available. So where will we go today? Today we'll start by just recapping some of the difficulties that we all face in terms of collecting face-to-face uh, -face or online survey research. We'll talk about the key role in participant investment in getting good quality data. Then I'd like to talk a bit about one of the solutions that myself, Boris, here at the ANU and some colleagues came up with. And to do this, we made our research more shiny, which is an online uh, open source platform developed by our studio to make interactive web platforms. But then finally today, I'd like to talk about how you can make your research shiny too. And think that the only limitations to this platform is your own creativity. So for a long period of time, we used to do research like this. Paper and pencils to do our surveys, um, having a good marketing spiel to approach people um, and ask them to complete our surveys. Uh, I guess my, my personal strategy was often to target the the libraries to try and find students who around exam time were really keen to try and find a, a desperate excuse to procrastinate and they were really my target market but luckily now things have changed and the majority of our research is now done like this we collect surveys online which is really fantastic um, and 
no wonder. I mean, online research is, and online survey research is really dominating um, psychology. It's comfortable, it's easy, we can reach a very large, broad range of audiences. And these days, it's so rare for people to be more than a few, a few metres away from a phone or any kind of computer. And the only reason these days that you might do paper and pencils, it may be a cognitive task or kind of an ECG task or whether you require something that requires that person kind of in person to respond to what you're doing. But let's look at survey data. Uh, top journals in many fields of psychology publish the majority of their manuscripts now based on survey data. In fact, you know, as you can see there, depending on the journal, upwards of 90% of manuscripts submitted are based on these self-report surveys. Um, if we choose to administer the surveys ourselves, the cost of this is it almost requires approaching each person we wanted to do the survey face to face, kind of a, a direct contact methodology. Sometimes we can use fantastic groups like uh, sample size on Reddit, uh, different Facebook groups. Um, however, even using these online platforms, often it still requires uh, reaching out or still having that similar marketing spill to, to what we had when we had to approach students in the library, almost selling our research to each person individually. So it's not really efficient. It's no wonder then, kind of the dominance of online research platforms. Luckily now we can get good quality responses from an amazing array of online platforms. Many of these platforms can get entire samples in under a day. Um, and you can see there that over a thousand studies in 2015 was published based on MTurk data alone. Um, but unfortunately here we're still faced with often uninterested and, and what they call professional respondents. So people who are completing it to make an income. So they're not really caring too much about the individual responses or the interests of the survey. Um, you can see the first logo there um, is uh, Qualtrics, there's also WJX for, in China, Prolific, and a lot of these platforms are very reasonably priced and can get a lot of data very quickly. But for those people who have used the, I guess, the larger, more professional platforms, um, the online research unit is a good example of this, or uh, uh, official Qualtrics polling, um, polling sample, well, if you've had that experience, you might have a similar reaction to this. That can be somewhat eye-watering and prohibitive. A short 15, 20 minute survey can cost $4,000 for 300 participants or so. Let alone if you're doing a large sample technique, you in wanting a thousand participants, you can get upwards closer to $10,000. So it really does become a huge burden um, at the moment in terms of costs. Um, as I said before, often we're faced with professional respondents or people who, even the kind of students who don't care too much about their individual responses or the survey at large. Um, but this is quite different. I mean, we are definitely blessed to have many people who volunteer their time for a cause that they see is important or really personal to them. And, you know, they can see that the research is really worth doing. And we're really lucky to have those people kind of be involved in our research. And there's many different factors that we've identified that can really influence the quality of responses. So obviously the length of the survey is a big factor. If somebody's completing a survey with 5,000 questions in it, the chances of them ac um, accurately responding to question 4,300, I mean, they're not gonna give a really strong response to that because they're gonna be so overwhelmed with the length of the survey. So short, short surveys definitely do much better. The type of the task and, and what they're asked to do in the task, whether it's a cognitive task, a survey, uh, watch something or rate something, uh, the size of the re remuneration or the, the prize that they're going to receive, um, with some um, more recent research suggesting that that remuneration can be quite important up into a certain point, and then kind of large prizes actually don't add that much to the quality of data. Potentially also the oversight that's there, individual investment and interest in the the task and impact on knowledge. So all these things can have uh, an impact on the quality of responses, but also people's motivation to, to do the research.
even for people who are quite interested in our research, often we might only give them a thank you or our contact details or a worst case scenario, you know, please click this link if distressed, which can be a big letdown for people who are genuinely interested in the research, who are keen to participate and want to know what's going on. Uh, more diligent researchers might provide um, uh, maybe an information sheet or a link to other papers. They might upload their paper to a repo or to an online resource to access later. Um, but it, it, this, is, this is, you know, a lot of us we do, do try to give, and lots of different researchers do try to give good quality feedback. And this, you know, especially important in, say, clinical organisation or some um, scholastic settings where the research might be part of a broader study um, or individual um, treatment efficacy programs or anything like that where much more personalised feedback um, can be used. But this really posits the question of the day that I'm hoping that we can answer, is how can we make participants actually want to complete our study and care about how they respond without incurring large costs or without personally having to, to debrief each participant in person. So how can we do that? So I'd like to welcome everyone to All Things Shiny. I'd like to introduce you to the R Shiny platform. Um, and this is a lovely Shiny app. You can see here on the left is my Shiny app. So if you look to the left side um, of the window there, you can see Hello Shiny and a slider input. So in real time, the user can change the slider input and based on some coding in the back, the histogram there to the right will change instantly. In this instance, the person can choose how many bins they want to have in their app. This then sends back to R, changes the, the, the histogram and then sends that back to the user. So Shiny is an R package that makes it easy to build interactive web apps straight from within in R, or within R Studio. Um, you can host standalone apps or you can have them in a web page. These can be indexed or non-indexed. For example, they can be available for everyone or the public to, to search and to find. Or for example, if you're using these to explore some data or to engage with something with your, your lab or your research group, then you can make them non-indexed so people can't search for them in Google. Uh, you can embed them in, in R markdown documents, for example, in PDF or HTML. Or if you want to get more complicated and more fancy, you can also embed these within uh, what they call dashboards, so kind of larger server and things. Uh, if you want to extend these further, we can make them quite complicated. You can include CSS themes, HTML widgets, and also kind of JavaScript actions. So really, all you're limited here in terms of the user putting some kind of input into the program and then what kind of output you want the user to receive. So we had this idea and we thought, well, is there a way that we could adapt this to allow participants to get custom feedback on their survey results in real time? So welcome to our world of shiny based surveys. To achieve this, what we did is just use that simple idea, that open source platform within R, to build a customised website um, that provides feedback. So this is our website on two-dimensional Machiavellianism. And for those people who have been, um, had, had to listen to my many talks on Machiavellianism, it's the willingness to exploit other people uh, for the greater good or to see other people as about to exploit you as well. So it's better, it's kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's better to get them first. So you can see in, in here we have some information about Machiavellianism. I'd like to really thank as well Boris Bozumik here at the um, ANU, but also Todd Williams at Grand Valley State University and Martin Selbom, who's now over at the University of Otago, who really helped with this project. On the left-hand side, you can see different uh, tabs that we just put within, within R. You have a welcome page, there's some information about Machiavellianism. You have more information. There's a GitHub code, so you can download all the code for the website and, and adapt it for your own website. But also you put up there some information for other resources, so different questions and different how to, to, to do different kinds of research for people to access. But the most important thing there for today's talk is the test yourself tab. When participants click the test yourself tab, they're presented with lots of inputs, Likert scales in this case, which then communicates to R, K 
calculates their results and then gives them the feedback. And this is what it looks like. So here we have our awesome keen users. They access our shiny website. They fill out the survey. That data then goes to R. And this is where things split. So using the Google Sheets 4 package, it then stores that data on our Google Drive, uh, in our Google Sheets, so we can store our data for use in a later in, in research or whatever we want to use it for. But then also R also sends back the output back to the user to be amazed. And this is what the feedback looks like. So here you can see there's a few simple normal curves, which originally compared each, each respondents, each participants, um, uh, scores to a normative sample, but now we've told R just to extract the website data. So as new people complete the survey, that, sur that data pool gets bigger. And when new people complete the survey, it gets compared to that. This is using the, uh, the, the, the UK's BBC News' theme, an idea of how to display information. And you can see here that they get three different feedbacks of how their scores relate to your overall samples. So we might say here, well, you know, this is fantastic. Are people actually interested in this? Are, do people want to learn about themselves? Are they keen to get feedback um, on, on some of these psychological researches? So as of uh, yesterday, we had uh, 9.9 thousand unique viewers, uh, unique users use the website, which resulted in 12,000 different uh, uh, sessions. So some people are completing the, the survey more than once. On the bottom here, you can see kind of over time from the beginning of the, the year um, up until now, and you can often you can note there how there's some flat points, but there's also two big spikes there in the data. So this is where um, a new media was a fantastic um, asset to have and, and Rachel Curtis there at ANU, absolutely reach out with, to her if you have any um, uh, any needs to, to advertise the research or to, to you want to you know, do any uh, media work. But ANU Media did the first thing there, How Machiavellian Are You? And that was released in April. And then later um, in late June, early July, uh, Sima Keita at uh, All in the Minds in the ABC did a, another bit of advertising on this as well. And each of those were two big spikes in respondents. It does look at, like it peters out in comparison. However, we're still getting maybe 150 to 200 respondents every two weeks or so. So there still is lots of people out there who are very interested. But then we might say, well, who is interested? Where are these people? Who are these people? So this is our, our data extracted from Google Analytics. And you can see that obviously based on the ABC and A new media's advertising, the majority of people are coming from Australia. But we're still getting people from North America, South America, and really still kind of all over the world with a few exceptions here and there. So it looks like there is a kind of a big appetite out there for people to learn about themselves and to be more engaged in the research if they are provided some kind of feedback or to learn about themselves in some way. Um, so who are these respondents? Well, we've had maybe 55, roughly 55% of these people have been male, um, which is fantastic for a psychological sample, given that, I mean, at least my experience doing, doing surveys, uh, in, especially with undergrads, can be a very high majority female, so it's great to see a, a more even gender balance. Um, and it's, no, it's no surprise that the people who are completing this, given it was advertised through kind of ABC um, and ANU Media here in the ACT, were economically believe in kind of a large government based on some of the questions that we asked, and also socially progressive. So being more willing to, uh, to value that people can, can think and can do as they wish. In terms of the age of our respondents, uh, the main peak is around kind of late 20s or around 30. These are the kind of the people who are interested in this kind of research. But one of the really nice things about this is we still get quite a lot of respondents in kind of the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s age, age range there. So you may be wanting, also asking, well, how Machiavellian? 
we talked before about Machiavellianism is this tendency to rationalize exploiting other people for the greater good. Are these people who are more Machiavellian or less Machiavellian or uh, people who want to find out about themselves given something unique about um, who, who they are or who they believe they are? Well, in fact, what we find is a nice normal distribution. So uh, people who tend to do the survey looks like it's um, the distribution reflects the general population of people being kind of in the middle of the latent scale there. Um, and getting a really nice kind of distribution of people from all walks of life. But the next question is how good is this data? Is it good quality? Um, you know, we're not paying people for it in any way. It's completely, completely based on their own initiative and their own interest. Well, if we compare our findings to the broader public or to, to previous research that we've done, um, if you look at the internal consistencies of the scales that people are, um, that people are completing on the website, in previous research, we've found that the scales range kind of in the, the views a bit lower because, I mean, they're both only six items, but in the 75 to 85 range with tactics being a bit stronger. In the, in the table there, you can see the response from our data. They really were kind of falling in the middle to the upper range of the internal consistencies with good um, estimates of internal consistency there. We have alpha and omega based on your uh, statistical leanings and then also fairly strong average inter item correlation averages. So it looks like these scales are at least working how they're intended to work and they're fairly reliable. But if you look at some stricter tests of the data coming in, from confirm um, confirmatory factor analysis, um, for those people who are kind of, are C, uh, kind of interested in, in CFA, you can see that the, um, the website data on the top right hand there, the fit indices are all quite strong with CFI above uh, 0.95, SRMR at 0.037, and uh, RAMCA below 0.06. But then in a comparison, if I was to compare this to our previous, previously collected online data from MTurk um, and Polyphic, it looks like these responses are actually stronger in our current website. And similarly, when we administered the same survey to a matched university sample in the University of Otago, so in New, um, New Zealand, um, the fit indices on our website are much stronger than that. We have no data about why this might be, but our theory would be that, well, people here, when they're genuinely interested in learning about themselves, um, not about kind of the payout, then they're more likely to take their time and to complete kind of the survey um, with a high quality of responses. So to the future and beyond. So where to from here? Well, given the, how the, the kind of the success of this early platform, we're now going to try something a bit stronger. So we're going to try a much more of a survey based technique. Um, previously, it was pretty much just the, the Machiavellianism scale, but now we're going to try a range of different uh, questions in a much longer survey to see how this goes. On the left here, you can see the feedback from the Big Five personality, our um, ubiquitous model of understanding um, normal human uh, individual differences and variation there. So they get a feedback on all five of, the, of their dimensions. And then on the right hand side there is a need to belong scale. They can see whether they need to have, have this inclination or its desire to be accepted by other people more or less than the average that we're comparing them to. The other benefits that are available through this platform is that we can give feedback because memories are forever. So we can have people uh, download, as you can see here, they can download their own printout. Um, this is in HTML, so they can go through and select their feedback for each of the scales that they completed, along with the information and further readings on each. Remembering that this is completely customized to whatever kind of they scored on the survey, and they can quite easily download this. Also, we can have this emailed out to them if they really want to have this emailed. Uh, that will all happen um, through the Arshani platform. Now, I know that lots of us aren't engaged in, in survey based research, and you may be thinking, well, how can I make my, my research shiny as well? Here's a platform that we built um, to monitor psychologists' uh, mental health and well-being. when clinicians can fill this out and then they enter in their ID. And over time, they can graph their well-being, 
their burnout and also their secondary or vicarious trauma at the time. So they can see whether they're trending up or trending down and put things in place or engage in self-care in advance. Um, once again, this uses exactly the same platform and exactly the same techniques as a survey um, with the information being stored in a Google sheet. And then just when people enter in their ID, extracting all their previous, all the previous times that they've completed the survey and then putting it into, into the Shiny platform. Uh, we've also started using this platform for engaging in statistics where people can and students can play around with different distributions um, with different techniques or different analyses and see it change in real time. But we can also engage, as you can see, in uh, other very essential monitoring tasks uh, for a bit of fun. I put this together uh, the last weekend. I managed my, had my first attempt at smoking meat and I uh, wanted to measure that the temperature of the meat over time. You can see there that we have the shoulder, uh, the shoulder piece of meat from the thermometer, the neck piece of meat and the chamber temperature. Um, there's a dip about 7 a.m., 6 a.m. where it got really cold and I fell asleep. But at the same time, I learned lots about smoking meat. The reason I bring this up is because it allows us to see the flexibility on what we can use these platforms for. But I know what a lot of you are thinking. I've done R in the past, I've heard it's difficult, it sounds complicated, there's words I don't know. Uh, do, do I really have to become an R buff? Well, let's check this out. Here's our simple um, app before we had on the left hand side, we had the user input, which in this case is a slider scale. Um, and on the right hand side here, we have the histogram, which is the output. And as, that, uh, as the user changes the, the number of bins, the number of the histogram changes, based on exactly what they input. So here's all the code you need to do that. On the left hand side, you can see that it tells it the server. So the server is the R side of things and it tells it to render a plot. Um, and to render that plot, uh, it tells it to do a histogram and to make the number of bins, whatever the user inputs. On the right hand side, it dictates the user, the user interface. You can see here there, the title, call it hello RSP. Um, halfway down, you can see that it tells it to put in a slider input. And then below that, in the main panel, you can see the plot output. So that's our, that's our histogram. So that is all the code that that, um, that, that app requires. Um, but unfortunately, that, that isn't too much code. And I think it's, it's more than palatable for everyone, uh, everyone who's interested in this kind of research, especially kind of breaking this apart and just changing the code. However, some assembly is required. So there is some uh, basics needed to be able to kind of change the code. But most of this is quite um, understandable or, or you can break this down simply from the, um, from the apps that are there. You can simply just kind of change the code to your needings. There's also fantastic uh, Shiny tutorials and help communities. Uh, RStudio will host five apps completely for free. So you can have five of those online at any point in time. But also what you can do is that's only online. So it, it, as soon as one of, one of these surveys or one of these studies that you're running, you no longer need for the moment, you can put it to sleep, open a different one, and then um, wake it back up at a later date if needed. It's all deployed and it's all happened straight within our studio with a simple click and it's all good to go. But if you are interested in doing the surveys, you know, incorporating this kind of feedback into your research, I have uploaded the skeleton code uh, so the, the outline of all the code required for the survey website um, to you can see there uh, the GitHub logo um, and also to the open science framework. So the full skeleton code there, pretty much plug and play, good to go. Um, and please let me know if you need any help with implementing, implementing the code in your research. So, there's obviously going to be pros and cons of commercial platforms versus shiny. I mean, commercial platforms are very easy to use. We just put in the questions that we want. Participants become extremely quickly. Um, I said before that you can often get your, all your participants even in a day. Uh, it's also very familiar to us all. The cost of this, that the cons of this is often it's quite costly. It's very limited to the platform, but you also can't integrate it within larger within larger websites or give more information to researchers or more information 
about the research. You can only really administer the survey and there's obviously no feedback. So you're relying on word of mouth or uh, prizes or remuneration in some way to get people to do your survey. On the shiny side of things, um, it's amazingly customizable. Anything that you can think of doing with different input styles, uh, different output styles, whatever you want to do is, is doable. The only limit is your imagination. We can have feedback and intrinsic incentives so people complete the survey because they actually want to know their scores, not because they want to get paid. Um, but also we can integrate that within other, uh, within the, as you saw with the Machiavellianism website, we can integrate that within the broader scheme of things, more information about your research or more information about your lab, other links and other things that they can do. The cons is also going to be, the cons of this is obviously going to be a shallower learning curve. So it's going to take um, a bit of time to get used to the code. Uh, but once you get used to it, and once you have your own kind of skeleton code, similar to what we posted online, you can really take it and run. You have to recruit your own participants, but you can, you can even do, you can even ask uh, participants within other frameworks, so like MTurk, Qualtrics, Polyphic, to to do the survey research as opposed to a, to a Qualtrics or a Google survey um, page. Uh, and then you can also be scary. It's always hard learning new things. But luckily, uh, there's fantastic materials available on the Shiny website. Uh, as I said before, we uploaded the skeleton code for the website, which is completely open source, completely freely available at the Open Science Framework and on GitHub. Um, if you want to give it a go yourself, you can always just try the scale there at machiavellianismscale.com. But also, we're always here, um, always willing to help with, with your research or to help you shine like you already do. Now, I'd, I'd love, thank you so much for listening today, and I, I'd, I'd love to, to hear any questions that you might have about this. So I might hand it back to uh, Michaela, if that's okay. Or to Christian, yeah. sorry. Or Michaela. <laughs> so we've, <laughs> we've just got a question from uh, Julia. Fantastic, Connell, thank you. Could this be used clinically, um, for example, for a routine outcome monitoring and feedback? Thanks, Julia. Um, yep, it absolutely can be used for anything that you can think of. It can absolutely do that. You saw before with our clinician wellbeing that we're using that to monitor. Um, and once again, at least that, that website that we've built is open source. It's not part of any kind of survey or anything at this point. It's really out there for clinicians to use. But in terms of clinical research, you could absolutely use this as well to get people to um, uh, monitor their own mental health or you know, obviously to get feedback on how they're going throughout a treatment. Um, the other idea there would also be something to share with the clinician that people could fill it out and then you and the clinician could discuss the results or give the, the clinician information about even the therapeutic alliance or about outcome measures or potentially even anything that isn't, uh, that the participant doesn't, oh, sorry, that the, the client or the participant doesn't want to discuss in sessions could be used for that as well. The only difficulty, at least with the way that this is set up at the moment, is it, um, it is everything's done through Google Sheets. Um, you might have to think about the level of privacy required. Um, if Google Sheets is fine, or you, you, could you could anonymize the responses and participants in some way, and you could absolutely do that. Um, but you might have to think more about um, maybe an, an SQL database or something if you wanted something that's um, much more secure. There's SQL backends absolutely already built, and the packages are already designed for this, um, if that's the way that you want it to go. Thank you, Connell. We have another question as well. Um, Michaela, we might go to Michael and we can unmute Michael and he might be able to ask his question uh, verbally, if that's okay, Michael. Yeah, so, um, hi. Thanks for that. Fantastic, Connell. Really great. Um, it's exactly what I want to do um, for our prejudice sense uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, turn it into a prejudice, you know, version two, so that people can get feedback. But we use a lot of um, open-ended questions. So a lot of people, mm -hmm. we ask people type in your experiences. Can, do you, can you, can the system handle it? Um, I, the question, so would, would be for me in understanding that would be what kind of feedback would you like to give the participants? Well, we, well, so good question. Yeah, fair enough. We, we do have 
quantitative or scale data. So we'd probably give feedback on the scale data mm -hmm. and not the, we wouldn't do kind of content coding through the system because I don't have any idea how to do that. But if people can at least, but a bit, the, the major focus is actually people's rich and subjective texts that they're giving us. Yes. So I don't want to get rid of that. No, no, absolutely. So I, I guess um, I'm going to try to give a very broad overview today. Uh, but if on, within reason, if you can think it, you can do it. So the way that this, this platform works is you can select any kind of input you want. There's text input, there's video input, up, anything you can think of. I think there's at this stage 20 or 30 different kinds of, of user inputs that you can use. Mm. And then what happens is, is that thing gets sent to your, your server end, so your R, and then you can do whatever you want with that data. So you can send some back in terms of, of feedback, then you can store others, you can send it all, you can send it all back, you can store it all. Um, for that new study that we're about to launch in India, what we're doing is actually getting R to calculate, um, for example, the um, uh, all the compute all of our variables, get rid of all the um, poor responses, and then only send us the clean data or even send us a, a report ourselves. Wow. All that within R. You can absolutely do that. And if we, in terms of, of storing the, the text responses, you can just store it in the Google Sheets, but only send back, you know, whatever you want to send back. There's, if there is an R package that's codable for qualitative responses as well in the future, then you could even get R, the R server to run the qualitative analysis on the data if, that's, uh, if that can happen through, uh, through an R platform and then send back that as well. So you can do whatever right. you want. Or what you could even do is have two platforms, one that sends the feedback to the respondents and then another one that you log into that just sends you a different kind of feedback. Wow. For example, with, with this data, we had an admin login where um, it had a little admin tab that you could download the data. You just click download data from it or you could, um, I just told it to plot some different plots and statistics so I could log into there whenever I wanted to and just see that. Great. So, and so in the feedback, I could say, um, uh, you wrote this and just pre present it back. And when you answered our scale data, whatever, you, you know, um, here's how you, here's the distribution of previous respondents and this is where you fall. So I could, I could do both of those. Yeah, yeah. so I just, if you look at this, so this is the, the downloadable report. So you can have it on the website. Um, so you can see here our text and that text can be just raw text or you can input values. So you can say, without even giving this in, in a text, you could say you scored 20, you know, input user, user data um, on this scale or you, to the, when we asked you about this, insert text response, paste te the text response in. Um, this is what you said in the past. And similarly, exactly for this, this downloadable report, you can, this is all what I put in myself. So I wrote all this and then I just said, for example, here, um, plot a histogram and plot what they what they got, and then the bottom here, I've you scored, got a score of four. Uh, this puts you higher than sixty six point six five percent of your peers. Um, you can also have confidence intervals or whatever you wanted. Here I've said because on the website I've asked, do people want to be compared to men, women, or to everyone? Here I've told it to print out um, these results are compared to everyone just as you requested, but it would say right. women or would say men as you requested as well. Right. Okay. That's uh, fantastic. So just one follow-up question in terms of kind of following up uh, Julia's question as well. Does, if we use Google Sheets, does Google own the data? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. I'm actually not sh sure um, on that front and it's something uh, that we'd like to know. Um, so these, it, studies, these studies have all passed through ethics. Right. Um, in terms of the, the It would be possible. So it would be possible to do a workaround where all you would do is you would have an Excel sheet in the the root folder that gets updated. So it actually doesn't actually leave or go to Google. The only difficulty that I would see there, and the reason I didn't go with that approach for this platform, is that you may run into difficulties if two people do it at the same time, because right. then you have because the benefit of Google Sheets is you know it allows like multiple users at the same yeah. time, whereas yeah. an Excel sheet wouldn't. Um, but I'm sure there's a way that, that we could do that as well. The alternative would be, it's a little bit more difficult, but I'm sure maybe we, I could help you or Jamie maybe could help you, is just to have an SQL server. So I'm sure that actually there would be an A&E database and you could try and link that in the back end. Right, 
Great, thanks, fantastic. I'll let someone else ask a question. Okay. Thank you, great, great presentation. We have a question from Cassidy and we also have a raised hand from Erin. So maybe Cassidy, if you have a microphone, we could go to you first and then to Erin after that. Um, hi, Connell. I think, hope you can hear me. Um, great presentation. I was just um, wondering, I guess, from an ethical standpoint, if there were issues with giving um, feedback, particularly for like clinical traits or clinical disorders, um, things like eating disorders or depression, anxiety, those sorts of things, um, and how you handled that, I guess. Great, thanks. I think that's a lovely question, Cassidy. And it's definitely something that requires a lot of feedback. And the, the downside, so obviously in a clinical set setting, the benefit there is that you could actually talk and work through the feedback with, with your participants. In this case, they can't. Um, so what they're doing, they're almost left alone to their own devices with the feedback. So I can actually point out, you have to be very, very careful with the feedback that you give. Um, on the website and in the feedback form, we really express it's not clinical data. Um, and then that there's kind of larger confidence intervals and it's really there just to learn a little bit about yourself, but also being really careful with the way that you word things. And at least in, in as you can see on the screen at the moment, with this feedback, it's still not finished because we, we really want to be careful, especially with these last two here. You can see the experiences in close relationships um, and also the need to belong scale. We're not quite sure whether uh, how we can give this feedback in a kind of responsible way or whether we should give this kind of feedback at all. So these are the really good kind of questions to think about. Um, but definitely, I mean, when wording things, being really careful around just emphasizing that it's not feedback uh, so it's not um, not clinical or diagnostic feedback, and it's really there just to kind of learn a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Connell. Thanks for that. Okay, Erin, you should be able to talk now. I think Karen came in and then disappeared. <laughs> so maybe we'll come back to Erin in case. Oh, raise hand again. <laughs> oh, oh, she's in. Wonderful. Great to see you, Erin. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Connor? Perfect. Okay, beautiful. Hey, so my question was really the same as Cassidy's, but um the work you're doing is really fascinating, obviously like opening lots of interesting doors in, in terms of the way we communicate with a broader community about the work we do. So from that perspective, really, really cool stuff. Um, the question that came up in my mind was really very similar to what Cassidy has said, but sort of even outside of the clinical context, right? So we're doing, we might be doing um, research that is sort of at its like early stages and we don't yet fully understand, you know, how reliable our measures are. Obviously, I'm talking outside of your area, but like, for example, in clinic and in, in experimental psych mm -hmm. um, or in cognitive psychology. And we know that, like, you have a slide right that says memories are forever. I'm thinking about my own research um, on giving feedback to people about their own experiences and how that can actually change their memories. So I'm curious, right, about where where is the boundary condition about when we should be sharing individualized feedback um and what 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 do you think have you pondered this it sounds like you have in the clinical space um any other thoughts when i sort of push you over to the experimental side um so i guess if i heard you right you're, you're wondering about what would the cost of, of giving feedback be whether it would change their behavior after that time yeah, I think there's there's some interesting potential, right? So I'm thinking about you know some of the false memory work um, looks at you know giving people feedback or other information how that changes their memories and behaviours, mm -hmm. and you can think about that in a really positive way. You know, you could produce positive changes, but it could work in a negative way too. So yeah, it's just curious. It's a similar sort of question that Cassidy asked you, um, and maybe your answer's the same. Yeah, well, it's interesting and actually. When you say that as well, what comes to my mind is kind of, um, 
I don't know whether it's uh, astrology or you know that kind of things where you read your you know you read your uh, briefing in the morning with your yeah. or something and then you go out and you go fantastic today's going to be a good day so you you run and do all these fantastic things and the day was fantastic not because of the, of the horoscope but it was fantastic because you made it fantastic um, yeah actually that, that's a fantastic question in terms of, of, of the feedback and it's something that actually we haven't thought about in too much detail kind of going forward what we try to do is when we express the feedback is uh, at least on the website, it gives you confidence intervals and those kind of things. It also just really yeah. iterates that uh, these things do change um, and they're not based on you know, obviously clinical and hard feedback. Um, but it does make me wonder whether that would be kind of interesting, something to look at in terms of yeah. follow-up research and it easy to give people um, uh, unique identifiers and you could say, you know, we gave you this feedback, has anything changed? Uh, also, I guess on the ethics, side of things that might be actually really kind of important research to know especially if we start to do this more commonly and, and give this out we really do need to know whether i guess how people are using this information coming back um, yeah that's really interesting even thinking about you know asking people at follow-up what do you think your feedback meant mm. what, what do these things mean yeah that very very cool stuff i'll let someone else have a go uh, i assume i know actually wonder with a follow-up question around um do you remember your feedback? That'd be awesome yeah. as well. Without cheating and looking at your report. <laughs> well, thanks, Erin. We have time for other questions if people want to type them in or raise their hand. Hi. Connell, um, sorry, one more question I had was um, around the cost of getting people to participate. So would I be correct in saying that it's free for the researcher um, if they use a platform like this um, and they can just literally advertise it and market it as finding more about yourself and that way you don't use avenues like Facebook or MTurk where you do pay Mm -hmm. um, the participants are large, or not the participants, but the different platforms. Yeah, that, that's, th thanks, Kathy. That's a great question. Um, one of the, the real powers of R is that it is open source and it is completely free, and that's always the way it's going to be. It's actually uh, a while ago. It's where it, it kind of devolved. Uh, it kind of diverged from other languages, where the kind of the R people wanted to make everything completely free and open source, and that's the way it remains till today. R Studio, which is a more corporate side of R, makes it free to the public. But if you want kind of the more high end or you want individual management, then you can pay, which we wouldn't use unless we're a large business. So what that means is that for us and whenever you want to, it's all completely free. Uh, the shiny package and also R Studio is all completely free to use. Uh, R will host five websites of yours completely free. Uh, at any point in time. But what that does mean is that you can sleep, say, if you ran five studies and you want to run two more, but you're not doing the old ones, you can put the old ones to sleep, you don't delete them, you put them to sleep on the server and then open the new ones. Within R and R Studio, it's, uh, it's really just one click. So once you link it up to your R, the top right hand corner, you can just click, click to deploy and then it's, it's on the server end of things as well. Um, it's a bit, it's a little bit harder if you want to make it indexable so if you want a robots text in there, so if you want it so that it, it appears as like a main search in Google, there's ways that you can do that. It's a little bit harder. It's much easier just to pay, but there are ways that you can do it for free, like linking it to a different website. Um, but if you don't want to make it, make it indexable, like so the Machiavellianism scale, as you can see there, that was, that's, not, that's not indexable, um, but that's all free. So you can just click on that and, and go to the survey whenever you want. And that's where I'd suggest if it is something that you think people would be interested in, um, absolutely touch base with uh, Rachel Curtis at Amy um, Media, who's really fantastic to me. And you can see there the advertising that went out. Um, yeah. Is it kind of how Machiavellian are you? And that was in the, the, the great toilet paper uh, yeah. pandemic or epidemic where uh, the marketing team came up with this idea of, of you know, um, getting all the toilet paper and defending for yourself or leaving only getting one piece and, and letting other people use it. And then as part of that same, um, uh, Sana Keita at All in the Mind and ABC actually read that and then did a short piece on it as well. 
you can see that that was responsible for the majority of the things there. There's also other big websites, like what comes to mind is um, uh, yourmorals.org, uh, where I think, I can't remember how many people have completed that, but they did some marketing in kind of the newspaper and some other avenues, and they would have had you know, um, tens of thousands of people complete the survey as well. So it's absolutely worth trying to find some way to market. But as I said earlier, that we're still getting 150, I think I last time I checked 138 over the last kind of two weeks. So we're still getting kind of this trickle now, once it's out there, people are completing it. But yes, yeah, wow. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Connell. So we have Nima has his hands up, hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, hi Nima. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering uh, if I want to, let's say, conduct the research on social class, uh, based on your experience, uh, to what extent do you think I can get access to people who come from uh, lower class and middle class or upper middle class and stuff like that? Uh, is there any information about that? I think uh, that would be, I, I'm actually, I'm not quite sure how, um, what comes to mind, I'm not quite sure, but kind of an easy way to do that. But what comes to mind is it'd be more about how you advertise and how you market this. Um, once it's online, it's just a simple uh, web applet. So it's just, it's just a website that people can go to, they can do it on their phones. In fact, I think it looks much nicer on the phone because it already renders everything for the phone. It looks, it looks much nicer. But what it would just be about is about how you're able to communicate that this research is available and that it's interesting and important uh, uh, to the people in your target group. So depending on where that is, that might be through you know, different channels or, or kind of word of mouth or anything. But what we found here is that once enough people know about it, then it kind of maintains itself because there's still people clicking on it and doing that. I think that would just be about how you can, can kind of communicate that to your kind of your target market. Okay, thank you. Any other final questions from people? I might ask one <laughs> before we wrap up. Um, I'd be really curious, Connell, this kind of uh, branches a little bit from both what Cassidy and Erin were asking, what would be your immediate reactions to things you wouldn't use this platform for? So you sort of mentioned clinical, are there particular areas or particular things where you think the feedback would not be appropriate or this wouldn't be ideal for those kinds of areas? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, I, I definitely think anything that uh, actually is as Erin quite nicely pointed out before, anything that you think that people are going to make um, uh, life, like well, at least kind of important life decisions on or any kind of way, shape or form uh, in clinical, maybe even forming a sense of self or understanding the self. It, it, it's, you're basically leaving people alone with their own devices to understand this themselves. And it's very rare that especially clinical feedback or any kind of feedback can be understood in isolation. So my suggestion might be to... Um, uh, if you, you have people who, do, who get different schools, you have a different kind of feedback um, or even just being really careful about the kind of information that you're putting in there. Definitely anything about um, or anything that also seems kind of really certain about them. Like, this is definitely who you are. We all know from the reliability of measures that uh, you could take a measure several different times um, and get, get slightly different scores. So really being sure to, be, to insert those kind of caveats. I guess anything there that you think that people are going to, or people might misconstrue, be left alone with this and misconstrue uh, the results. What, what comes to my mind is also potentially using this, if you were going to use it for more of a clinical setting, it could also highlight certain things and then, you know, please, you know, bring this into your next session or something. Or uh, potentially what you could do is have it send the report to your clinician or to someone else, um, to kind of in the back end. It would be quite easy to do as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, Connell. Um, I think that's pretty much it, I think, for the day, unless anybody has burning questions they want to send through before we wrap up. Um, 
I want to say thank you. I thought that was fascinating, a really interesting topic, um, something that's nice for us to be thinking about in terms of engaging with our research more broadly, but also the ways we can help engage people more um, in the research that we're doing. Uh, but also those ethical questions as well, I think are really important for us to be thinking about. So I wanted to say thank you, Connell, on behalf of the the clinical theme, <laughs> but also your colleagues um, <laughs> more generally. Um, and uh, we're really excited. We have another um, present. We have Louisa Talitsky um, presenting when we come back after our teaching break. So we have another group of really exciting presentations for the second part of semester two. So thank you, Connell, and thank you to everyone. And we hope you have a lovely rest of the week. So see you soon. <laughs>